And we're back. All right, so last video, this is part three. Last video ended talking about how Napoleon was so awesome throughout Europe, but he just can't quite get England. Okay, so let's talk about his first punch at England, Napoleon. Okay, in 1805, Napoleon said, you know what, maybe I'll just invade England. Now look, guys, this does not happen, all right? Really, the last time somebody successfully invaded England was 1066 in the Norman Conquest. Now, if you're really a smart aleck, you might have said, hey, what about William of Orange with the Glorious Revolution? True, that was an invasion, but they opened the door for him and they let him in. So nobody really forcibly invades England. And Napoleon is going to be no exception. Okay? In 1805, he is going to try and pick a fight with the largest naval power on the planet. And he's going to lose. Okay? In 1805, Napoleon is going to fight the Battle of Trafalgar. Okay? Look it up on your phone. I don't have the board behind me. Okay, so he'll fight the Battle of Trafalgar, and the leader of the English is going to be Lord Horatio Nelson. Okay, now it's at this point that you can see that the English have the superiority in terms of naval warfare, and they shut Napoleon down pretty quickly. Now, to Napoleon's credit, he doesn't keep trying to bang his head against the wall. He's like, well, you know, they just got lucky that time and, you know, we'll regroup and we'll launch another invasion and we'll lose again. To his credit, he realizes, okay, I'm not going to beat the English at, at sea warfare. That just is not going to happen. They are too good navally. However, maybe there's a longer term strategy. And what Napoleon creates is something called uh, the Continental System. Okay, he is going to try to put a, an embargo, he is going to put a blockade around England. He is going to prevent continental Europe from trading with England. Now, the thought is, if they destroy England's economy, then they will be a lot easier to take over later. And make no mistake, England's an island, okay, and, and they have to trade for a lot of the materials they use. And that's why they have such a big, uh, you know, world empire is that they're bringing in goods that they can use in England. So Napoleon says, well, let's cut that off. Let's put a big embargo around them. Nobody in Europe trades with England. Now, you have to understand, England, England sees this and they hear this and they just laugh. Because A, England has a gigantic empire. They don't have to trade with England. Or they don't, um, England does not have to trade with continental Europe. They just don't have to do it. Second of all, their, their ships are so good that France can't really hold up the embargo anyway. And other countries inside of Europe are ignoring the continental system anyway. Okay? So that being said, when we're talking about countries ignoring the continental system, most famously it is going to be Russia. Now, this is very important, guys, because this is going to bring about kind of the downfall of Napoleon here, okay? So, with that being said, Napole Napoleon's saying, Russia, stop trading with England. And, of course, Russia responds, duh, comrade, we are not trading with England. Yes, we are, ha, ha, ha. And they keep trading with England. Now, Napoleon cannot have this, because if Russia continues to trade with England, well, what's to stop Spain, what's to stop Portugal? What's to stop Prussia or Austria or the Dutch? Nothing. And then Napoleon, his authority means nothing. So it's at this point in 1812, Napoleon goes, we're invading Russia. It'll be quick. It'll be easy. I've beaten the pants off of Alexander before. I'm going to do it again. Alexander the Tsar of Russia. And I'll do it again. These guys are not a good army. And look, make no mistake, Russia, the Russians are not a good army, all right? When it comes to actually skilled combat, they're not a good army, but they know that. So, in the late summer of 1812, Napoleon starts his march towards, towards Russia, and he wants to teach the Russians a lesson. Now, the Russians know that they are not going to beat France in a fair fight, so... What the Russians do, what Alexander does, is they practice, catch this word, 
they practice what is called scorched earth policy. Now, you have to understand what scorched earth policy is. The Russians, they would see the French army advancing and they would pretend like they were going to go fight them. So we're going to go fight them. And you know, everybody would get up and the French would like, all right, we're going to go fight you now. But then the Russians would retreat and they would back away. As they are retreating, as they are backing away deeper and deeper into Russia, they're burning all the crop fields. They're slaughtering all the livestock. They are killing everything and retreating further and further and further into Russia. Now, of course, the French army, they know that once they catch up to the Russians, they're going to beat them. They keep following them. But as they keep following them, there's a larger distance between France and the French army. And that's exactly what Alexander wants. He's bringing him deeper and deeper and deeper into Russia. Now, what was supposed to be a campaign that lasted a couple weeks will last a couple months. Okay? When they're leaving in late summer, it's going to be very much different when they have to leave in winter. Okay? Finally, right outside of Moscow, the French and the Russians, they will finally go to battle. It's called the Battle of Borodino. And, and, and guys, you got to understand this. The Battle of Borodino, the Russians lose about 40 to 45,000 people. The uh, French lose about 30. And, and the, the French do win the battle. But the Russians never negotiate. The Russians never go meet Napoleon. They just let him sit. And Napoleon's realizing winter has already set in. So now... Really, in some of the harshest conditions of winter, Napoleon is going to have to take his troops from back from Russia to France. And this is where he is going to lose a tremendous amount of people. Okay? And now, if you read five different textbooks, you might get five different answers. But Napoleon will go into Russia with anywhere between 600 to 800,000 troops. Okay, just different textbooks to tell you different things. He'll come back with less than 100,000. Okay? This is called the Great Retreat. As Napoleon is coming back from Russia, the Russian winter is devastating to the French army. Keep in mind, they don't even have any food, all right? And they're dying of exposure. So, of course, as they're walking back to France and they're dying one by one by one, Somebody is sitting in the cheap seats going, oh, oh, this is so good. This is good. And that somebody is going to be England, all right? Because England, when they see Napoleon, his army just being devastated, they're ready to pounce. And they, and they will pounce, okay? Now, with that being said... Napoleon will be defeated in 1814. Now, keep in mind, he doesn't have the troops that he had before, and he is very vulnerable. So they defeat Napoleon in 1814. Now, the question is, what do we do with Napoleon now? Okay, you could say, hey, let's go kill him. But you have to remember, he is super, power, uh, well, super popular and powerful among the French people. You kill him? They're going to rise up and they're going to use Napoleon's death as a rallying cry to just keep fighting. Now, of course, you could keep him around. He's like, okay, we'll put him in jail. We'll put him in good English jail, which didn't really work well with, the, with Charles, all right? But we'll put him in good English jail. Now, of course, if you keep him alive, there's always the threat that he comes back and leads a revolution again. Now, when it's all said and done... We're going to see that the English, they will exile him to the island of Elba, which is really, it's in the Mediterranean. It's really not that far away. And they will restore the Bourbon monarchy in France. It'll be headed by Louis XVIII, who is the brother of Louis XVI. Okay. So they restore the Bourbons in France. Now, people are, people are not necessarily excited to see the Bourbons again. Okay? Remember, they got rid of the Bourbons in 1789, or I guess 1793, okay? But they got rid of the absolute monarchy in 1789, and now in 1814, it has come back. All right? So they're not necessarily happy. Well, of course, and I highly suggest you read the Count of Monte Cristo because it talks about this. 
Napoleon will escape Elba, and he is going to come back to France. Now, a lot of people in France were like, Napoleon is back, and he will be back for 100 days. He will rule for 100 days. Consequently, this is called the 100 days, okay? Now, now don't be silly. I mean, the minute he gets to France, he's got one thing on his mind and one thing only, and that one thing is England. He's like, well, I took that L earlier. We got we to gotta get that win back. We got we to gotta avenge that loss. So the first thing he does when he gets back to France is that he is going to raise up another army. And, and he does raise up an army to his credit. But, but keep in mind, this army is not the best soldiers. All of his best soldiers have actually died in Russia. And there's something else we don't talk about. A lot of them also died in Spain. Okay? But that's all of his best soldiers. So now the soldiers he has are old men and young boys. Okay? Now, this will all come to a head at Waterloo, okay? It's called the Battle of Waterloo, okay? And we're going to see that Napoleon is going to go up against the English commander by the name of the Duke of Wellington. And very famously, Napoleon is very overconfident, and he states that, you know, Napo uh, Wellington is a bad General, the English are a bad army, and the battle will be over by tea time. Now look, the battle is over, but Napoleon will take another L. Now, of course, the question is again, well, what do we do now that Napoleon has been defeated once more? Do we kill him? Do we execute him? Or do we exile him? Now, with that being said, again, they exile him, but they learn from their previous mistake. They don't exile him near Europe. They exile him on the other half of the world. And, and strangely enough, I mean, Napoleon is not an old man at this point, okay? And he's relatively healthy when he's exiled the second time. But within 18 months, he develops something with his stomach. Some say it's cancer. Others say he was poisoned. But he will die in exile, you know, roughly 18 months later. OK, it's at this point that the English, they will restore the Bourbon monarchy, but it is in the context of a constitutional monarchy. OK, all right. Now, that being said, we are done with the French Revolution. We're going to see what happens in Europe after this. The next video we're going to talk about will be with uh, terms of the Haitian Revolution, which is very much different than the, than the French Revolution.